in, in, in one sense, the huge victory, the huge victory we had over German intelligence in, in the Second World War, which was capturing all the German spies, that wasn't particularly the humorous bit, but then turning round the best of them into double agents, which fed not merely Hitler's high command, but Hitler personally, with all kinds of stuff that wasn't going to happen. You know, only a long tradition of being uh, national pranksters can uh, enable to do that. And just, just one example, having fooled Hitler as to where the, uh, the Normandy landings were going to happen, uh, the um, uh, claim being they weren't actually going to happen in, in Normandy, uh, the double agent um, uh, who was given the code name uh, Garbo, uh, on uh, receiving the Iron Cross on the, uh, the orders of Adolf Hitler, replies, at this moment, I am so overcome with emotion that I cannot put my feelings into words. Why couldn't he? Because he was rolling around on the floor, helpless with laughter, together with his MI, MI5 controller, that's why. Uh, well, there's a bit less humour, as you, as you mentioned, ar ar around what was going on with some of the personnel who were then in MI5 and the other security services who had been recruited by Stalin. The, 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 uh, well, it started off as the first, second and then third man, and we now know there's a fourth and a fifth man yes. in, in, the, in the Cambridge mm. spy ring. Philby, Burgess, McLean, Blunt and ultimately Cairncross were all exposed. And and they were recruited between the wars by people who one imagined from reading all the sort of Chapman Pincher style mm. books mm. with these devilishly cunning Soviet controllers. Mm. And one of the surprises again in your book is that actually MI5's assessment was having seen what they were up to, that these people really weren't all that good. Well, one of them was uh, devilishly cunning, but of course it makes uh, it all the odder uh, that MI5 should have let in as its official historian, somebody from the same university as, as these people. <laughs> I mean, there, there are plenty of universities, Cambridge included, which have sent really good people into the intelligence services. But except for Cambridge, it's usually been to the intelligence services of our own side. Uh, <laughs> Cambridge, alas, can be said to have had a more cosmopolitan attitude. Um, mm -hmm. We provided the best people for, uh, for both sides. But uh, the reason why this was possible is not merely that Cambridge produced very good recruits, um, but um, also that there was no such thing as, to use the jargon, protective security in the 1930s. At the Foreign Office, not merely did it not have a security department until World War II, didn't he even have a security officer? So in the 1930s, there are two bright young things from Cambridge, bright young diplomats who get in. Uh, there are two uh, cyber clerks who are working for the, uh, for the Soviet um, uh, Union. So we really make it very easy for them. Mm. Um, but there was also a, a feeling of there was a bit of a kind of a class blind spot. These were the right sort of chaps who had been to the right sort of schools and the right sort of universities and were in the right sort of clubs. Couldn't possibly be traitors, old boy. Oh, absolutely. And furthermore... Uh, the only thing that would make them even more unsuspicious is when they admitted to um, uh, being <laughs> a little bit on the, on, on the left. You know, uh, there, there used to be this uh, uh, platitude which uh, said, and it continued, I remember it, well into the, the 60s, uh, somebody who is not a socialist at the age of 20 has no heart. Someone who is still a socialist at the age of 40 has no head. Um, so, in, in other words, when Donald McLean was asked at his interview from Cambridge into uh, the Foreign Office, um, and do you have um, any um, interests in uh, Marxism, Mr. McLean, he said, well, to be absolutely frank, yes, I did. And to be even more frank, uh, yes, I still do. And they thought, what a good and honest fellow, rather than <laughs> he was about to be 16 years spying for the Soviet Union. And the damage that this did, because at the end of the... Second World War, British intelligence had a pretty formidable reputation. It had supplied wonderful intelligence on everything the Germans were doing. It had been hugely successful in almost everything it seemed to touch mm. during the Second World War. Mm. And then during the 50s, the realization peters out that it had been penetrated very, very seriously mm. by Stalin's intelligence services. Mm. What damage did that do in Britain beyond with the American relationship as well? Well, I mean, the main damage that it did was to people in uh, Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe, after all, before the Second World War, had not been part of the Soviet bloc. Uh, but um, the Cambridge Five, the five um, uh, most successful traitors produced by Cambridge University, or as the KGB, which uh, loved Westerns after the Magnificent Seven came out in 1960, was a huge box office success, started calling them the Magnificent Five. All the names that they passed over uh, to people who had, without necessarily spying for Britain at all, uh, had um, uh, been sympathetic to British um, interests before during the Second World War. Either their career or their life was ended. Uh, so the, the nasty, nasty side of the five is that every single one um, has blood on his hands.
And one of the most fascinating things about this scandal was how long it then took to unravel. You re there's, there's a huge account you have in there of this terrifying QC, Sir Helenus Milmo yeah. <laughs> interrogating Kim Philby, mm. the sort of mm. central, longest lasting, highest mm. ranking of the five. Why did it take so long to pin it down? Well, I think there are two reasons. Uh, one of them is that if you get in very early, um, you've, and there was no vetting uh, when the Magnificent Five got into the various corridors of power they, uh, they got into. Um, later on, finding evidence that you can use in a court of law is actually uh, very difficult. I mean, after all, one of the um, biggest secrets of, I suppose, the British judicial system is that a high proportion, perhaps even a majority of those who commit crimes, can uh, expect to get off scot-free because it's incredibly difficult to produce evidence. Not they were guilty, but incredibly difficult to produce evidence uh, that they were uh, guilty um, in a court of law. Uh, and the other problem was that um, in the final stages, MI5 bungled. It had a particular notion, um, which it got from a defector, that all five had been in Cambridge at the same time. So, you know, they discovered that um, the fourth man, mm. uh, Anthony Blunt, had been working with the Russians. They discovered that the fifth man, John Cancross, had been working for the Brus Russians. But didn't quite fit. Never so quite it took them an awful long time. Actually, it cracked who the Magnificent Five were almost 20 years before it realised it had cracked it. And one of the things that, that um, strikes you also is, is the attitude of MI5 to subversion in a wider sense. You know, there are lots of worries are brought to it about communist penetration in the unions, in the parliamentary Labour Party indeed. But they seem strangely reluctant to do a great deal about it a lot of the time. Well, you see, because MI5's view was not expressed during the Cold War, um, but quite a lot of politicians' views were, the, the myth grew up that actually what MI5 did during the Cold War was to look for Reds under beds, from time to time claim that it had found Reds in beds, and then uh, go and tell supine politicians and governments that this is a real problem and they should deal with it. Actually, it was the other way around. Um, more often than not, it was governments uh, and oppositions, um, both Conservative and Labour, that hyperventilated over what a threat this was. Uh, so there's this extraordinary example in 1961 in which the then leader of the Labour Party, Hugh Gateskill, uh, the deputy leader, uh, George Brown, and the man who is about to become, for a short period, uh, British Foreign Secretary, draw up a list of 16 Labour MPs who they think are really secret communists, and nine who they think might be. And Gordon Walker takes this along uh, to MI5 and attempts to interest MI5. Uh, MI5 said, um, uh, no, this is part of politics, can't deal with it, but didn't take it seriously at all. When they left, it just thought, oh, God, how do we deal with these people? But actually, it did get one <laughs> thing wrong. There was something that the leadership of the Labour Party knew uh, that uh, MI5 didn't. The number one name on this list is Will Owen. Will Owen, who was MP for Morpeth. Uh, this is 1961. We now know that um, beginning in 1954, He'd worked for the close ally of the KGB, the Czechoslovak uh, Intelligence Service, the STP, and he wasn't caught until um, uh, 19, 1970. So actually there were one or two things uh, about bad behaviour that the leadership of the Labour Party knew at the beginning of the 1960s that MI5 didn't. And in parallel with this sort of epic struggle with, with, with the Russians and uh, the other sort of communist secret services, there are also, first of all, there's the, the MI5 is having to do battle with the IRA, which mm. is a quite separately or, organised threat, and then mm. later on is having to move to, gr to grapple with al-Qaeda and associated yes, terrorists as well. Was it an easy sort of switch of gear well, it wasn't, from one uh, threat to another? It wasn't an easy uh, switch of gear. I mean, moving from uh, counter-espionage, which is what had been found to deal with, um, to um, counter-terrorism, which is what it mainly deals with now, was not easy. But it was made much more difficult by incredible governmental um, uh, incompetence. So here's the deal in the 1970s and the 1980s, remembering that the Northern Ireland Troubles uh, begin, or uh, the most recent phase, in, in 1969. If there was a terrorist threat uh, to, uh, from any part of the world uh, to the United Kingdom, it was the security service, MI5, which had the lead role in dealing with it, with just one exception. But unfortunately, that was the one exception that uh, they counted. Uh, that is to say, the, uh, the IRA. Why? Because uh, the special branch uh, of the Metropolitan Police had been given in 1883, after a bomb attack. outrages. That, that, that's, uh, that's right, the di dynamite war. Uh, the lead role and the great law of Whitehall is what you have, um, you hold. So it's not until after 
the second attempt to assassinate a British Prime Minister, John Major, in 1991, that MI5, at long last, had, just in time, in my view, uh, given to it the lead intelligence role. Of course, it was not until 2007, only three years ago, that it was given the lead intelligence role in, uh, in, in Northern Ireland. And one um, one so, quick thought, if I may, because time is running short on yes. this, alas. How good have they proved to be, if you had to make a global assessment of how effective a shield MI5 is for this country? How good are they? Well, my view, and it's just um, uh, my view, um, is that they've been pretty good. But here, here's the difficulty. You judge an intelligence service not by the things that happen, but by the things that don't happen. And the fact that the IRA, when it uh, has a credible strategy to uh, really undermine the British economy, fails to destroy the city of London, which it tries to do and comes fairly close to doing in the 1990s, I think that was a great success. Secondly, um, even though there have been terrorist, Islamist terrorist successes in Britain, um, uh, 7th, 7th, 7th of July uh, 2005, uh, followed by the failed attempt uh, a fortnight later, we have not had a 9-11. And yet, as we now know, in the summer of 2006, there was something worse than 9-11, which almost came off. And this was uh, uh, suicide bombers um, getting on uh, seven planes who were leaving Heathrow in a three-hour period across the Atlantic uh, with um, uh, bombs disguised as uh, soft drinks bottles with, um, uh, with detonators. And if that had all come off, and it came pretty close to, to getting off, that would have been the worst terrorist outrage actually in human history. So, you know, it's only, we've only been, had to face uh, the Islamist terrorist threat for 10 years. To declare it a success just on the basis of the first 10 years is premature. Uh, but I would simply say that the big thing that has not happened a British 9-11 is a success. Now, the, the, the other thing that one always has to think about with security services is the question of who watches the watchers. Mm. Can security services become a threat to democracy? And the whole Peter Wright saga, the spy catcher saga, the, the rogue MI5 agent who was, uh, in his words, burgling and bugging his way mm. around London mm. during the Wilson years because he suspected that the Labour government was sort of quasi treasonous. Mm. Is, is there now a sufficient system of checks and balances in place? Once upon a time, no one ever talked about. Mm. the security services. Now there's a parliamentary committee that oversees them. Mm. Uh, can, we, can we sleep safely in our beds in that regard? My view would be broadly yes. Uh, in other words, uh, Peter Wright was a complete pain. He was a conspiracy theorist. He was a liar. He was all kinds of other things. But really villainous people occasionally do good without realising it. And there were two things that were terribly wrong about um, uh, MI5 when he published his forbidden memoirs uh, in the middle of the 1980s, 1986. Um, one, that MI5 had no legal basis. Um, there wasn't a Security Service Act which firmly established it under statute law until 1989. Now, I think that it was all the furore of the, uh, of the right case, incredibly bungled by everybody who had to deal with it, which persuaded, well, first, it persu MI5 was already persuaded, but it persuaded the Thatcher government, which was not persuaded, to do this. And then, secondly, you know, uh, the demand from people who even include me at that point that there should be some form of parliamentary accountability, which can't obviously be on the, uh, the floor of the House because you can't talk about who's an agent and who isn't on the, on the floor of the House. Uh, but the Intelligence and Security um, uh, Committee, yeah, I think Wright, although he doesn't de deserve to, bears some of the credit for that. Now, since it be got going in 1994, I would say that um, there have been few parts of government which have had such uh, a positive uh, series of judgments formed on them as the uh, British Intelligence Committee, which doesn't prove that the committee is, is right. It's simply that if you, if you compare the reports on the British Intelligence Community with uh, the reports of uh, other parliamentary committees on other parts of government, well, actually, um, I would say the Intelligence Community comes towards the top. Well, you've given us a, a fascinating window into a very secret world. Christopher Andrew, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. And Book Talk will be back again next week. Join us then.